It's, it's been a great week here at Lake Wobegon. You know Garrison Keillor, I hope. I think this crowd certainly knows Garrison Keillor. But it's been a great week here at the Aspen Institute. Just to give you a quick snapshot. Our board met this past week. Dan Porterfield is in his first full year as president and CEO. He announced uh, some very important new initiatives. And the chairman of the board announced a very important gift from the Resnicks to create a Herbert Byer Center here on campus to help us to live more fully into our mission. <clears throat> we had Frank Gehry here on campus celebrating him for his contributions to art and design and creativity. And the last two days we've had all of you here on campus, 14 of the leading scholars and experts on Bauhaus. It can't get any better than this. So thank you for being here. We have 125 participants in the audience. And <clears throat> nothing like this goes without a lot of work and a lot of time and commitment. And so before all of you leave at the very end, I want to, at the very beginning, recognize a good number of my colleagues who have worked really hard to produce this event. Kitty Boone and John Melgard, Deborah Murphy and her team, Lauren Wilder and Margaret Mather, Katie Viola, who's on our design team, Chloe Tabah and our entire SOF team, that's Warwick and that's Stephanie, and of course our extraordinary curator, Lissa Ballinger, who has worked really hard providing us artistic advice and design. And of course we couldn't do it without our advisor, Bernard Jazar, who has just been so vital to everything we've done since we started this entire uh, program. So, can we give him a... <clears throat> We've received a lot of questions about this incredible backdrop here on stage. Uh, just a footnote about its history. The design was inspired in 1926 by Endor Vanager, a Bauhaus student known for starting the Bauhaus Jazz Band. And if you're interested in learning more, we have information at, at our concierge desk out front. I don't think I need to introduce the, the five of you. Um, this is our last hour with all of you. I have a few leading questions that I want to ask with the end goal of getting all of you in conversation with one another. And then I'll reserve the last 15 minutes for, for questions from the audience. 50 years ago, Bauhaus was not as celebrated as it is today. Gropius was still alive. Bauhaus was crumbling. It was not entirely airbrushed from history, but it was certainly not a household name. Today, Bauhaus is synonymous with design. But 2019 is quite different. In every corner of the country and the world, there are celebrations and symposiums like this marking the centennial of Bauhaus. Everyone's talking about the great architects of Bauhaus. What is motivating this moment? Why is Bauhaus being celebrated like this today? You're looking at me as though I have the answer. I'm looking at you as if you have the answer. <laughs> you could at least start. I can probe. I think uh, it's a good thing that this is a numerous panel because I think that's a really uh, tough question, which is not the question one might have expected on the final panel while I gain time, while I think, um, <laughs> which would be, you know, what is the legacy of the Bauhaus today? And we've been discussing that. But why suddenly is there yeah. a desire to uh, figure this out? particularly after this interruption, and I think there's been reference already earlier today uh, to the rather um, the, the parody and the assault of, uh, of Tom Wolfe, but he was not alone in, in those years. Um, so I can only say what I hope it might be. I hope it might be some uh, desire to reconnect uh, you know, with a kind of authenticity of creativity. I hope it's not simply a desire to have something of the sheen or what is, I hesitate to say, the style of the Bauhaus since we've tried mm -hmm. to deconstruct that. Um, but maybe there is also something of a nostalgia for, uh, for the utopian aspirations of the Bauhaus um, that might not be fully articulate, but perhaps, and others might agree or disagree, perhaps that's part of it. 
Um, I do think, in general, it's carried along by a revival of a return of interest in modernism in a fairly, a fairly broad, but not uh, across the board, uh, population. Things like Dwell Magazine, which celebrate yeah. mid-century modern. Um, you know, I have students who talk about mid-century modern as though the people who practiced it were talking about it in those terms. Um, so uh, I think Bauhaus rides along with uh, so that doesn't answer your question. That, in a, in a sense, adds to it. How do we, yeah. uh, how do we account for a revival of interest in the modern movement and expressions of modernity in experimental design culture uh, after the decades of postmodern mm. postmodern critiques of demolition of modernism and postmodern return of decoration and frivolity and uh, kind of frank embrace of the, uh, the commercial and the non-utopian. Mm. I, I could add one reason that I think, uh, not here, but you know, the biggest uh, Bauhaus 100 uh, celebrations are going on all over Germany. And I think that's really sent a signal out to the world. And, and everyone else has thought, yes, we need to think about this movement. But one thing I might add to that is I think part of the reason that, that, I mean, one of the main reasons that it's so huge in Germany is the German government has put a huge amount of money uh, on the block and did that well in advance and said, you know, create great exhibitions. So, you know, this is wonderful because it's, it's great art support for something that matters, but it's also a country that constantly has to grapple with its own history and wants to remind the public as, you know, they don't want to airbrush the, the very, horrid parts of their history, they, they are eager to say, this is not all that we are. So I, I just put that out there, not to be cynical, but just to say, you know, all remembrance is always somehow uh, inflected with politics and, uh, you know, what's motivating the memory. So. Yeah. If I could just add one small yeah. footnote to that. When we did the 90th anniversary exhibition at the Bauhaus, it was a particularly strange number to pick for celebrating the Bauhaus. But it was done in collaboration with the three Bauhaus institutions. We could talk about why there need to be three. But in any case, for them, it was an anniversary of reunification. Mm -hmm. So the, the 10 years ago, the uh, Bauhaus celebrations and the launching of these competitions that have now coming to fruition were very much tied to reunification. Mm -hmm. um, so I yeah. think, you know, yeah. just to amplify what you've, uh, what you've said, and I think the big bang of, of 100 years um, is, is in the continuity of that. I think if I can add one thing, that um, something that I've noticed is that this resurgence of interest in the Bauhaus corresponds to a resurgence of interest in Black Mountain College, which is considered to be one of the inheritors of Bauhaus ideas because the Alberses and others um, were emigrated and taught there. And I've thought about why Black Mountain College, why the Bauhaus, and have wondered if at this moment it has something to do with a return, a return to being interested in making things in, and, in, mm -hmm. and in craft, which is a strange thing to, to say perhaps because the Bauhaus in a sense moved away from that as we have discussed over the past few days, but there still was an emphasis on an individual making something. And I wonder if perhaps in our current moment in which we can become very easily distanced from the activity of making something and the tactile and um, aspect of making something, if that's part of why there seems to be a, a return to the Bauhaus, a return to a place like Black Mountain College. Mm -hmm. You know, Bauhaus only lasted for 14 years. And I'm, I'm curious if it had not been disrupted and say lasted for 20 or 25 years or 30 years, would we be here today? Would we be marking the centennial of Bauhaus? Would the influence be so expansive and vast? You're again looking at me, so yeah. I would say it's a question I I, 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 like I'm at a I, I yeah. often ask the, the, a, a version of that question, yeah. which would, would the Bauhaus be so famous if it had not, uh, you know, that part of its fame comes from its short-livedness, 
we tried to show over the last two days that even within that 14 mm -hmm. years, it's a very complex and movemented um, set of people and shifts that took place. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a short enough period and had enough unity and enough uh, impact and then the power of this name uh, that it has an enormous staying power. So the question is, would it have had that staying power if it had survived for X number more decades? In a sense, it's an impossible question because given the, situ given the situation of the rise of the National Socialists, um, you know, what would it have meant in real history if we were to ask the question in totally abstract time it probably would have eventually become so complex and so shifting over time that it wouldn't have that unity for remembering. remembering. I, I, I think we're absolutely gripped, though, and I, to answer your question, that by, by the short-livedness, I think it's because it's a community of possibility. Mm. Uh, uh, and I say that really seriously, a community of, of possibility and of experimentation, um, a trying out of ideas, of, of, of collaboration, of, 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 of what the idea of a discipline means at all, um, that, that if it become more institutionalized, if it continued, I doubt we would, we would be valorizing it in quite the way mm. um, that its short-lived life allows us to do. So I think, I think it's, it's all these unresolved possibilities that it gives us the reason we can endlessly return to the Bauhaus is we can pick up and as, as we have done one thing after another and go look at that isn't that extraordinary and look at this afterlife this possibility this uh, you know this this existence uh, for us now in the contemporary world so mm. short livedness is part of its extraordinary afterlife. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, yeah, you're going to say something. Do you want to go ahead? I, well, also just that it was then that everyone was dispersed. So they were these, you know, these people with this incredibly diverse creative toolkit who were set into all different kinds of ecosystem systems and often were teaching. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, sealing its fate then also maybe sealed its fame eventually. Were there any other schools or movements that have received similar attention and focus? I'm just racking my brain as we're having this discussion, thinking maybe you could talk to this because you know so much about the history of design education. But think about Cranbrook. I mean, how many there are how many conferences are happening right now about Cranbrook? And Cranbrook has never closed. It's still a vibrant, exciting place. It's had an incredible um, coherence of a historical period. It's not. Um, it does have the combination of a legacy of major figures and major buildings that sometimes might pull it away from uh, engaging. Mm -hmm with the contemporary situation in ways that might betray its, uh, its origins. But it, I, I don't think Cranbrook is very well known outside the borders of this country. What, what are the dates for Cranbrook? Well, Cranbrook is founded when? In the teens or 20s? None of us are Cranbrook specialists. 19, early 1920s, right? Yeah. 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 1902, that early? Yeah. OK, yeah. good. Thank you. Okay. And there's also the, the Borg Giebigenstein. How many people have heard of the Borg Giebigenstein? Excellent, excellent. Right, so this is the point I wanted to make. You know, a lot of Bauhaus members, when they left, they went there because it was doing a lot of the same really interesting stuff in a nearby city, Halle. It lasts a lot longer, and, and it doesn't have a Gropius uh, to give it a really cool name um, and to take care of its legacy and look after it and its people, so. What we know about 1919 was it was politically, politically and culturally an upheaval. Uh, the seams were coming undone. Uh, Gropia said the world was upside down. And the outer reaches is something that you speak quite a bit about, Edmund. The outer reaches, the Nazis going out, this displacement, and yet this unifying idea, this network that unified people around these ideals and this manifesto. And so in displacement, in exile, there is this kind of unifying connectivity. Could you say a bit more yeah, about I, that? I, you even talk about these buildings. Yeah, it was a loose yeah. phrase of mine, which seems to have lodged. But, um, <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, exile. You know, you have to really examine what exile is. You know, and it's, uh, you know, in some ways, exile is a state of, you know, unresolved tension between two places. Yeah. You know, you are you you have left somewhere unintentionally. You've been forced from a place that, that was your home 
and you are in somewhere else. So, you, so you're between two places, and you hold a tension between these two places. So what do you bring into exile? Homelessness. Um, uh, wh and what do you do about integration? What do you do about where you land? What do you, what do you want to make of the place that you're in? As you say, this is something um, that haunts me. Um, so what I'm really conscious of um, you know, in this place um, in particular is, is it, with Bayer, this, this alpinist, this, this lover of Goethe, who, who comes to this place and, and, and remakes this place um, according to Bauhausian ide idealism um, and uh, a sense of sort of high culture as well, not just Bauhausian sort of ideals, but, but a sense of, of everything we understand by German culture, sort of, you know, um, a sort of cultural literacy uh, that he finds a great home for here in, in Aspen. Um, and so when I'm talking about exile, I'm, I'm, I am very, very conscious as I walk around this campus of the otherness of this place. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm so conscious that he's grounding, he's learnt this landscape backwards. He's understanding exactly this place and what this place uh, can be. But he's also absolutely talking to his grounding, that first grounding um, in those early years in the Bauhaus. And so they are buildings in exile for me. You speak about this almost, this type of reorientation humanistically, that we're learning to see anew. We're thinking how to sit differently, to learn differently, to engage differently well, with the environment. Well, well, surely one of the things about the foundation of the Institute, this, you know, that wonderful strap line about humanistic learning is, is, is is that it, it was an attempt to create a new kind of space <coughs> where all kinds of, in this sort of post-war America, all kinds of people would be able to sit around those extraordinary tables together. So in some ways, it's a sort of attempt to kind of create a new kind of lim liminal space, a new kind of thresholdy kind of uh, threshold uh, here in Aspen. So it's a really, it's an extraordinary, it remains radical, is what I'm trying to say. Right. But part of the radicalism is this feeling of exile, that actually people, people, not many people, not many people at the Aspen Institute in 1949 were born in Aspen. You know, they'd come to Aspen. It's a place that people come to, bringing things with them. Right, yeah. I think one of the things that really uh, kind of amplified the Bauhaus memory in this country was partly this condition of exile, which meant that these people stayed in touch with one right. another. Sometimes they didn't iron out old differences, but sometimes they, they forged even stronger bonds because there was the connection to what had been left behind, whether voluntarily in the case of Gropius. And since you're speaking, I'm also thinking of, you know, England was a way station, so that's another all interesting question. But I think that keeping keeping and reinforcing and reconnecting those bonds, and then suddenly this proliferation of correspondence between North Carolina and Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Aspen and Chicago, et cetera, uh, creating a kind of network of the uh, of these um, displaced people, but many of them aligning themselves with very powerful institutions mm -hmm. and extremely powerful forces in American society. So this was a complete reversal of the uh, of the struggle that had gone on in that 14-year period mm -hmm. to try to continually to make peace with this government funding. Of course, the funding was largely private. Uh, you know, Harvard, you know, it's not a public university where most of these people land, um, with the exception of IIT. But, um, you know, Harvard University, the Museum of Modern Art, the, uh, you know, the Pepkas, which is, oh, yeah. you know, major Chicago business interest. Uh, they, they, the, the fact that most of them do not land, like many immigrants do, in the margins of society, but, you know, have people like the Warburgs, uh, floating the money to get the Alberses here. So they, the, it, it's, not, it's not the exile of everybody who's in exile. It's mm -hmm. the recreation uh, with a lot of help and, and, and generally a lot of receptivity um, mm -hmm. that I think then begins to amplify uh, the identity of having belonged to this lost place. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would also add to that point about a network that there was an urgency 
in connecting these emigres and trying to bring others out of peril in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so this, the, the epistolary record that Gropius is sort of uh, presiding over that says we have a hub, and he talked in mm -hmm. Cello, we have a, a nucleus uh, in Chicago now with Mies, we have one in New York, we have one in Cambridge, there's, you know, soon there'll be an outpost in Aspen. It's also about, it's about evangelizing for modernism, certainly, mm -hmm. but it's also about um, uh, a kind of looking out for one another, not just as a kind of friendly gesture, but coming out of a place of, of saying, you know, our lives were in danger just a few years ago. We've come out, we've, we've successfully extricated ourselves from that situation, but the initial group of, of letters that circulated and, and are in the archives among Gropius and others is a fund to send to those who can't leave Germany and who have been dis, disbarred from working and they're modernists who have gone into sort of internal migration. And so that is the, is the list of addresses which also serves later to try to solicit work, uh, uh, Bauhaus work to come. But first it's really, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a social network, but it's also uh, an existential question. Mm -hmm. It, that's uh, part of that is what I was thinking about with this too. Is I think the fact that they land here so well connected, you know, that already started before they got here. The ones who were able to get out were the ones who had reputations and connections to do that. So Mohoy Naj writes to his friend and mentee Marianne Brandt, "Learn English." I, I saw Gropius the other day and we're saying, what a shame it is that we, you're unemployed and your wonderful talents are going to waste. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going to see if we can get something for you. And nothing materialized. And she, you know, she went from this extraordinary multidisciplinary artist to someone who, I mean, just made the most abysmal paintings I've ever seen. They're just terrible. And <laughs> it was like every, everything went out of her, you know? She just kind of couldn't take being there. So I think that, you know, we, we talk about the Bauhaus in exile everywhere, but it's really a small percentage, the, the elite few that managed to get out and then go on and had these other schools. So many people stayed and were victims uh, mm -hmm. or were perpetrators or were just, you know, trying to keep their heads down and get enough to eat. In many ways, it was as if they were using these new platforms to speak truth to power, right? I wanna go to this idea of brand. We live in a very brand conscious society today, and so what influence did Bauhaus have on the way we think about brand and the way we think about identity? That one seems for you. <laughs> um, Herbert Beyer was obviously very talented um, and let's see, I mean, I think um, it's striking, it's, it came up in the presentations how often the Bauhaus rebranded itself. Um, it's, it's clear how often even Bayer rebranded himself and his different logos. Um, and, and only at a place like the Bauhaus could you imagine fights breaking out over who, who can legitimately use the square as their trademark. <laughs> so this idea, it actually is a bit pre, pre <coughs> outside the Bauhaus, but this idea that if, if your personal mark was a square, you were designating yourself as a, as a constructivist, and uh, maybe the square was red, maybe the square was black. But you have multiple figures who are locking horns, whether it's Arp and Lisitsky or, 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 or Burkhardt's is using one, and just the square, <coughs> and that is a brand that's then a vessel to be mm. filled with, with sort of content. But Frank Lloyd Wright tried to own the square. And Frank Lloyd Wright, yeah. too, and that comes out of, you can think <laughs> of Japanese prints and the, blot, the chop mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but yeah, I think, I think corporate design as such is something that, uh, you know, we talked about, about Gropius and, and Corbusier and Mies somehow meeting in Barron's office. Well, Peter Barron's becomes someone who thinks about designing a company's factory, its products, its logotype, and even what that would be, the a AEG, IG, the sort of German General Electric, so to speak. Um, and I think that comes through to the Bauhaus too, and the idea that, um, if you create something that's clean and simple and you use it again and again and it lodges itself in people's memory, then they will prefer the things that are associated with mm -hmm. it. And if mm -hmm. it's quality or if it's the Bauhaus itself as a brand, um, that visual language um, really has, has legs and it appears everywhere now. It was one of the, I don't, I don't know, maybe others know, if there were other schools in the period that actually taught advertising. Right. So this emphasis on advertising, I think there were others, and there's the Riemann School and others, but, but this emphasis on advertising at the Bauhaus, 
means that these people are extremely well prepared um, in Britain here to go into the world of um, the, into the world of advertising. I don't know if this study has ever been done to find out how many made it to America and ended up in Madison Avenue. And yeah, and there are, there are many German school design schools that are not the Bauhaus that have vibrant programs in Essen and Magdeburg and all over. But I think one thing that distinguishes the culture of expertise that's cultivated at the Bauhaus is saying, you know, not just am I a painter who has good aesthetics, but I understand attention and the economy of attention. And I think as we talk in a digital age about eyeballs and clicks and how long someone is staying on a website, that is coming out of this moment, I would say, when there are new demands, multimedia, distracting demands on our attention, and there's someone who's saying, um, as, as Bayer did, I understand how to capture, capture attention. Um, there was a major exhibition in 1930, Gefesselte Blick, Captured Glance. And I think advertising is an interesting word, and that's, that's um, reklam. But there's also Werbung, which is publicity. And so I think there's the idea, um, publicity can be anything. You can be selling a product, mm -hmm. you can be selling uh, a political idea, but it's fundamentally about transmitting a message in a really clean and effective way. Not so clean that it becomes generic and forgotten, but not so messy that it becomes, so, so it's, it's a fine line. Um, but I think, I think uh, um, it's also something that's very, sort of there's this dilettantish practice that no one's, uh, no one's teaching graphic design per se. Everyone's kind of figuring it out via painting, via architecture and other media. Mm. I think sometimes it's, it came across in ways that people didn't even know contained Bauhaus. The, there was a company called the uh, Mauritius Agentur in Berlin that uh, hired photographers on spec to create images that then could just be kind of sent out for advertising use. And Greta Stern uh, worked for them and Lucia Maholi did, among others. And uh, they're one of, one of their leaders, three uh, German Jewish emigres all left uh, and one of them had three suitcases of photographs. And I'm dying to go back in time and look in those suitcases. But he had these legendary three suitcases and goes to New York and founds Blackstar, which does mm. advertising and then Life Magazine, all kinds of things. And those images, some of them kept circulating for years. So um, there's more detective work to be done. But one thing I also wanted to say about the branding issue is I feel like you know, what Bauhaus is now for us, how it's been branded as, say, good design or the translation of um, good design into kind of everyday life, that's part of the legacy. But some of the utopianism, some of the, the early spirituality, the craft, um, but also the utopianism of, and the, the, you know, simple planning for everybody, that kind of thing sometimes gets lost as one of, one of the ideals of the Bauhaus. Mm. And surely, actually, at the heart of the utopianism is, is an idea of community. You know, that is so powerful now. It is so transparently, extraordinarily powerful that, we, that, that the idea of, of people who disagreed with each other being within the same building um, is, yeah. is, is mesmeric. You know, God help us. We need people to stay within the same building and disagree with each other. Mm. That's the kind of utopian community yeah. that we Disagree all Disagree and listen want. to each exactly. other. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It was Gropius who said, we need, to need a new man for a more new humane society. And so at the very core of his own thinking and philosophy was his uh, communitarian idea of how do we create and design a world where people could live in harmony. I, in harmony, I want to move to Bauhaus, or four different themes, and I want to open up to the, the audience. Bauhaus in the digital age for a moment. In 1983, here on this campus, the International Design Conference took place and Steve Jobs spoke. And that was his first real experience with the Bauhaus idea and philosophy. And, and this is what he said. I'm actually reading from my other, my former boss's book, Walter Isaacson. He predicted the passing of the Sony style in favor of Bauhaus simplicity. He proposed instead an alternative that was more true to the function and nature of products. Jobs repeatedly emphasized that Apple's mantra would be simplicity. We will make them bright and pure and honest about being high tech rather than heavy industrial look of black, 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 like Sony. He preached, the way we're running the company, the product design, the advertising, it all comes down to this, let's make it simple. 
really, really simple. Did he get it right? Is there an overemphasis on simplicity? Um, he certainly got something right. I think he really, uh, <laughs> and that line uh, from the Bauhaus to the Ulm School to Dieter Rams to Johnny Ive to Apple, I think is, is, is a clear lineage. I th and I think that was his, you know, the, 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 the obstinate simplification that, you know, one mouse click right. rather than two, you know, uh, on, on the mouse, two, one button rather than two, you know, uh, 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 as few clicks as possible to get from one place to another. But I think the question of industrial design is interesting. I mean, we've talked about form and function, and I'm, I'm struck, as prescient as the Bauhaus is, and as much as we've talked about his legacy, what also are its limits? And in what ways, you know, when, when looking at this thing, if form follows function, and I'm not the first to observe, you know, this is a black box as regards its function. Um, I mean, liter without the cover, it's literally a black box. But it, it, what does this thing do? Um, and its utter simplicity isn't reflected in the ways the, the, it's, it's all-consuming, geolocating ability to essentially you know, make me work for it and monetize my attention. Um, so, so Mark Wigley and Beatrice Colomina have this wonderful phrase that you know, the iPhone represents not an aesthetic, an anesthetic, something that smooths our, um, this hinge in our lives and, 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 and makes for a very frictionless operation. And it is frictionless. And I, yeah. I, it's why they break the world. And, 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 <laughs> what did you, know, you say? <laughs> That's why they break so often. Yeah. So it's like no, fri <laughs> no tactile friction. Oh, right. <laughs> but it's, so, the, so, so I think the anesthetic of, of actually simplifying something and smoothing it out, so I'm really beholden to this thing, um, is, is, is brilliant design as well. Um, so it is, it is, there's something about that anesthetic that I think and, is quite And, and the Bauhaus is full of people who are trying to bring texture and friction. It, you know, and that's, that's, that's one of the interesting things is, is that, of course, the Bauhaus is also full of craftspeople right. who, who are struggling to make things which may possibly look industrial. There are these wonderful stories of people who are making by hand things which actually are, are, are supposed to be in the industrial manufactured and uh, but but that idea of the friction of the world of, of getting things which are not an anesthetic beautiful done but actually are, are re-engage us with our senses I mean and people as wonderful as Annie Albers in her whole long life um, teaches us about about bringing us back to our to to the whole of our somatic existence, you know, the, the, how we can be through all our senses um, in the world. So th the, there are lots of other kinds of, other kinds of inheritance that we can get and claim from the Bauhaus, he says, thinking about the hand. Yes. Mm. Mm. And, and, and yes, and so, you know, the iPhone now has a haptic feedback, you know, to the hand, so you have your fingers. But I think I'm so struck by this lovely thing that Maholi Naj said, that the artist is the grindstone of the senses. The grindstone of the senses. And even there you have this, I'm thinking, Edmund, of I mean, just the tactile surface quality. And that we, we learn from media. We learn from right. the media around us. And, and at best, we can learn from the, the unintentional, disorganized, sort of anonymous genius of the city with all of, its, all of its influences. But I think learning from a medium is one thing. Um, now with artificial intelligence, the, le the medium learns from us. Mm. Uh, and I think that's a profoundly different world that the Bauhaus, yeah. we can take its lessons, but I don't think it can speak to what that means. Um, and you know, Maholi also said that everyone is equal before the machine. There's something equalizing, egalitarian socialist about the machine. In an age when people talk about algorithmic justice and that what you're looking at versus what I'm looking at yeah. is utterly different, are we all equal before the machine? Mm. So, uh, you know, I think it's an, another point where I'm thinking, so the Bauhaus takes us so far and takes us into the digital and you know, the experience of using the, the World Wide Web it would be unimaginable without the photo montage of the interwar period. So that, that aesthetic comes out of this moment, if not the Bauhaus exactly, at least the moment. But there are things that, that we are in uncharted territory uh, and sometimes maybe not even the Bauhaus can help us. Right, right. <laughs> this is about forging ahead. Yes. I, Jeffrey, we were talking about this this morning that Bauhaus is not a static idea, but is an evolving idea. Any, anything you want to say along those lines to this idea? Well, I think that um, 
as we've discovered over the course of the past two days, it's a, it's a slippery idea. And something that struck me when um, Robert was talking about advertising is that um, it may be that the, the impetus to communicate um, gener was generated at the Bauhaus in the advertising workshop, but the idea of taking responsibility for that is another aspect of what was unlocked. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if if um, that was there was a cognizance of that at the Bauhaus necessarily. Um, so it's almost as if the I'm trying to draw out a relationship between the kind of looseness of the formal aspect of um, thinking in terms of advertising, in terms of um, promotion, and the idea of taking this loose term and making it mean whatever we want it to mean. I mean, the German government, as Libby said, has a very clear idea as to what they want the Bauhaus to mean to them right now, which is very different than what the German government or another government wanted it or thought it meant to them at a very different moment. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a, there's something wonderful about that slipperiness and also something a little scary about it. Mm -hmm. Libby, I want to turn to you for a moment. Genius is such a male-dominated idea. 38% of the people in the Bauhaus school were women. Mm -hmm. And we know about five or six men that we constantly talk about and a good number of the women have been totally airbrushed from history. How do we think more broadly? So, yeah, I think uh, often when there's, uh, you know, people want to kind of shove all the blame on Kolpius and say he was, you know, he was keeping women out. He was, um, you know, putting them all in the weaving workshop. And I think we, looking back historically, have our own work to do, our own homework, our own discussions to do to constantly, you know, not be writing people out. And I think the fact that um, so much of art history is motivated either implicitly or explicitly by an art market that really wants, you know, these stories of great artists who are geniuses, who are unique to their time, um, you know, that, that allows us to look deeply into some works, but it often means we skip over others because, you know, there aren't not that much, many people in the public will tend to believe that women are geniuses still, even though I think the New York Times just reported most people now believe that women are either as smart or smarter than men. <laughs> this smarter, is apparently smarter. new. Yeah. Apparently yeah. new. Yeah. Apparently a new yeah. new phenomenon. At any rate, in the past, uh, it has not seemed credible to many, <clears throat> many of the art buying public that uh, women were doing something completely groundbreaking for their time. They were usually seen as derivative, and uh, that's meant that we've told a lopsided history too. So you know they were kept down to under fifty percent of the uh, population of the Bauhaus, and then we wrote them out even more than that. So. And I think, you know, it's not just women, it's, um, you know, LGBT people, it's uh, leftists, it's also telling the story of, of rightists who used the aesthetic as well. I think just thinking more broadly and really looking at, at what happened and, and what it means, that, I, I think that's the most meaningful, that's the most respect you can show history and the people mm -hmm. who went before us. Mm -hmm. Along those same lines, we, there's so much untapped potential. There are a handful of people that we constantly talk about, but the reach is far more greater. There was uh, a Hans Meyer that I think I spoke to you about. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about Hans Meyer. Well, this came up a bit this morning for those who were there in the architecture panel, uh, and it's also come up over and over and again historiographically how uh, because Gropius and Mies came to this country, there are moments at the Bauhaus to the extent that they wanted to embrace them were very well represented here and, and, and entered into the curriculum and the, the, uh, the ethos and also the mythos of the, uh, of the Bauhaus, whereas uh, Hannes Meyer's uh, trajectory was going to take him from the country with um, the two countries that had the greatest social and political revolutions of the mm -hmm. 20th century, Soviet Union and Mexico. I mean, we tend to forget that when he entered into, into Mexico, this was a country that had a very, very early um, uh, revolution. And therefore, 
uh, you know, there were all sorts of reasons that kept him out of our attention. It does seem in a period where we're concerned with ecology, with energy conservation, with uh, all aspects of green, uh, that um, it would be interesting to pay attention again to Hannes Meyer and to go to Edmund's notion of uh, unfulfilled uh, potential. There was a two-year period, but because it kind of went up in flame and was associated with two of the most evil words in the American language, communism and socialism. Um, there, it, you know, it, it still, I think, needs to be um, recovered more fully uh, in, in this country. If one wants to delve into the literature on Hannes Meyer, it is actually still today overwhelmingly in German. Uh, the earliest publication of his writings, which are also very interestingly, interest, interestingly are part of the early recuperation of the Bauhaus in the DDR. The copy I use of his anthology is a DDR publication. Um, so there, it's amazing that a, uh, a school which lasted for 14 years and has generated uh, exponentially more, uh, more literature, more books, more articles than let's say the Parisian Ecole des Beaux-Arts, mm -hmm. which dominated city planning and architecture in this country for several generations, um, that there are still periods in that 14-year history and practices in that 14-year history that are underexplored. And some of them, I think, have real potential to, uh, you know, to connect to things that are of interest. Now, connecting to things that are of interest doesn't mean that I think they're going to be very up to date. We got to this this morning in the discussion about uh, lead qualifications, et cetera. I don't, think that, I don't think there's necessarily a hidden template that needs to be excavated yeah. from, the from the archive. Uh, but we might realize that uh, some notion that there's some antagonism between modernism and social responsibility or modernism and uh, ecology, there are, uh, there are different ways both to have a revisionism of history and to find new inspiration, I think, in untapped potentials in the Bauhaus. Mm. I was just going to add to something Libby said. I think, I think it also has to do with whose work is valued and what counts as work, um, what counts as labor. Um, and. And yeah, I think even the distinctions between art and design and craft and craft having this subsidiary gendered designation um, is striking. And so even within the Bauhaus, that's so much about the leveling of the arts, it's still the Bauhaus. Architecture is still the literal yeah. pinnacle. Um, and so I think there's amazing research being done now on craft. And that's actually, it's a global story. It's, uh, there are fewer sort of singular male geniuses. I'm interested in a lot of design stories that have to do with collaboration in which it's, you know, no one's name is on the thing, um, but it came from many minds and many hands. And I think that's something that's, um, it's quite beautiful, it's important, it's often a better product, but it's, it's, it's harder for us to grasp. It's harder for us right. to value or sell. It's harder for us to have a soundbite about, um, but it's still incredibly important. Right, right. I'm struck when, you know, I'm working with, um, some public platforms on, on programming for uh, this Bauhaus here. And the, the designers that I'm talking with, the people, the sort of storytellers are, you know, they always want to boil it down to a name. And Hannes Mayoff you know, famously on one occasion got very upset because uh, one of his architecture designs was printed in a Czech journal with his name on it. And he just wanted it to say Bauhaus. He didn't want his name associated with it because he mm. saw it as a cooperative collective and that mattered mm. to him. Um, and with the collaborations, you know, as we've alluded to over these do days, a lot of these uh, famous men were so unbelievably productive because they were two people. You know, they had, they had a really awesome wife behind them usually who was just as good. We're, we're about to open the floor for questions. I, I have one more thought. We, I read to you the other morning the Manifesto by Gropius, and it was radical. It was disruptive. And... It invited all of us to think about the medium of design and helping us to think anew, to learn anew, to experience life anew, to create a more holistic society. And it expanded to his way of thinking about how a city was designed, how housing was developed, how people lived within community physically, how they touched their lives. It was about education, it was about learning. And so pulling the Bauhaus movement from the aesthetic and from color and the form of building. Who is thinking about these ideas in the manifestation today? I mean, 1919, 
seems very similar to 2019 in many ways. Mm -hmm. And the invitation to rethink and to reorder and to find this humanistic centering is, I think, as critical today as it was in 1919. Well, I think the simple answer is you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> that you're doing it at a place like the Aspen Institute, which, as we understood, um, or were, as, as we learned, in part was to add a um, humanistic thought into a broader culture. So maybe it's something, maybe it's a place like this mm. where conversations can be had that can think, that can think critically about where we are and experimentally about where we can go. Mm. I think ironically, some of the things that uh, were part and parcel of the condemnation of the <coughs> Bauhaus that somehow Mo Bauhaus, and by extension modernism, um, it wanted to make people live in little white boxes and was authoritarian and wanted to decide what lifestyles were, wanted to invent the new, the new society, the new man, et cetera. Um, now when we have actually city, city governments in this country that are faced with such inequality in housing, such absolutely crisis of uh, decent living, uh, and uh, even debating uh, whether the building code should be changed to allow for micro dwellings. Uh, suddenly, we, I think we have a change. This is just one example. I think we have a change of valence. The whole interest of European modern movements uh, in housing, in the, in the issue of existence minimum, what is the minimum that you need, right. uh, which you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s was 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 criticized as taking things away from people. I think we're again in a moment when we say we are in such a crisis on this planet at every level, demographic, uh, ecological, energy, etc., that it is imperative to think of these ideas positively. So it's not called existence minimum anymore, but we have very vibrant discussion emerging in the last few years on the idea of the micro dwelling. Mm -hmm. uh, we have. Uh, conversations about uh, housing that combines the uh, individual spaces with much more flexible uses of kitchens and intergenerational and families and the like. So I think that the uh, the the global uh, housing crisis and the and the global crisis of economic inequality has made a lot of the debates of the Bauhaus. Uh, something that we can honor again. It's not necessarily that the answers are lurking there, but I think it allows us to have a new respect for what went on there after 30 some years in which the Bauhaus was wow. condemned as condemning us to live in the modern world. Yeah, a framework for thinking mm -hmm. anew. Yeah. Edwin, would you like to say anything I, on that? I, I just return again to the utopianism, the necessary utopianism of allowing people to be fully human in their making, so to be fully present uh, um, haptically in the world by, by making things, by using them, by being present. And these are real human conditions that are, are, are taken away from people in so many communities through inequality and taken away through a terrible, terrible education system that strips out making and thinking with our hands, strips out art from the very beginnings of through status around academia and takes away all those creative possibilities. So I stand, rather sit, um, and say, you know, that's, that's where I go. Um, children, education, creativity, Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. You're being signaled in the back of the room. Mm. Wonderful, we have <laughs> time for questions. Joni. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I was lucky to see the Harvard um, exhibit uh, in May, which was amazing and inspired me to come to this. There was one piece in particular by Naj that I was very curious about. It was cylindrical, it was metal, it looked like a Sputnik, it looked like a satellite, and I was wondering, uh, also a little with Kandinsky, were they plugged into being curious about outer space, not just space here? Um, because it really looked as close to a satellite as you could imagine today. 
And then my second part is, do you know if any of NASA and the engineers, if any of them have been um, curious about Bauhaus and um, that particular piece in Naj? You should speak to so, it since you know the object. So I, so I, I think the object, and I, didn't, I, I think the object you're referring to is the light prop for an electric stage, sometimes called the light space modulator by Maholi. Um, what is that? And and and. Indeed, it's a, it's a good question. No, but call it the thing you, you gave it a nickname. Oh, the, the avant-garde disco ball, right? Yeah. So it's it's. <laughs> I think this this category breaking is so germane to to all of this discussion that you look at it and think, oh, that's a sculpture. It's static, and then someone explains, oh, you can plug it in. It turns on and it rotates. But actually, oh, you shouldn't be looking at the thing. You should be looking at the light that it reflects all around the room, colored light. And perhaps even in its original installation, it was inside a box. So you couldn't have even seen the thing. So it's not about the thing. It's what it produces. As for similarities with, with, um, with the satellite, I love that. I can't speak to it. Um, but, um, but there were these sort of cosmic ambitions of some of these. I mean, the, the idea of, of, of the, the telescoping scale of human possibility that we can you know, we design objects, we design cities, we design the Earth, and we can reach beyond it. I mean, I'm thinking of Otto Pina, uh, who taught at MIT, who was um, in some ways the inheritor of some of that kind of media design, thinking about light as a medium, right? Not, not, it's not about the metal, the medium is light. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, the Ur medium. Um, and as for the NASA question, I don't know, but I also love, love that idea. Um, and, but I do think, I mean, to the, even to the first question that we asked, why Bauhaus now, I do think that you know, the idea of NASA you know, problem solving on this incredible scale with these collaborative teams, I think that's another reason why we are interested in the Bauhaus today, the sort of the, we think of in our innovation culture. And you know, so many Silicon Valley firms look to the Bauhaus as a work play kind of environment and, and play as work and this sort of ludic uh, uh, possibilities. Um, which is also a way of keeping you at work all the time because you're, it's always, it's all play. Um, and <laughs> everything, you're sitting on, you know, bouncy primary colored balls and it's all, you know, it's, it, actually the Bauhaus uh, aesthetic is there visually, but also the idea that by play and interaction we can solve problems. So I do think that that kind of, um, the kind of moonshot ambitions for, for innovation also have a, a kind of fondness for what they mm -hmm. perceive of the Bauhaus. Um, just making things that no one's ever dreamed of. I could, I could say something brief about that, which is, uh, you know, they were very interested in, in the science of their time, and what they considered science isn't what we would even necessarily recognize as science. So Kandinsky was reading all kinds of science in, there was a journal called Sphinx in the later 19th century that was still circulating, um, and he was reading it also when he was an expressionist. But they were interested in astral projection, thought transfer experiments, I mean, actual experiments where, you know, a, a, a controlled medium would be thinking of something and in another room someone would draw you know a, something that looked sort of maybe like what the person was thinking about or drawing um, and other kinds of uh, ink blots that were manifestations of spirit because remember the x-ray is is brand new then and you know when uh, Röntgen's wife sees he he x-rayed her hand and she screamed and said, I have seen my death. And then in 1901, that becomes the most reproduced picture in the world, this, this bony yeah. picture with a ring on it. So, you know, they were attuned to the science of their time. They certainly were aware of, of planets and um, what else might be out there. Uh, but I think, you know, as everyone sort of a consensus is developing, the, the way f the connection to now is, you know, us thinking of the science and the emerging ideas of our own time creatively. I think so. Linda. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, this has been glorious. Thank you so much. We have enjoyed it tremendously. Um, I may be sorry I'm asking this, but I can't give up the opportunity with these great minds on the stage of asking you what you think of brand. Brand um, has become a four-letter word in some places. Um, we're grappling here on our 70th anniversary with our own brand. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered, I, I'm not addressing this to anyone in particular, but Ms. Otto said something so, so interesting to me about that there were many 
schools of art and design going on in Germany at the same time as the Bauhaus, but they didn't have as clever a name uh, and other accoutrement, perhaps, to survive in our memory, as the Bauhaus did. And I just wondered what you all think of brand as we sit at the Aspen Institute thinking of our own brand and how that's going to keep us in the minds and hearts of the intellectuals of the world. I think that's a great, a really great point. Um, and it's easy, you know, especially if you have, if you're a university professor as I am, you know, you have tenure, no one's gonna take my job away to start to think like, well, you know, I don't want the Bauhaus to only be capitalist. But I, I do, you know, I do, I am on record. I'm in a German documentary in German saying, I believe Gropius was a visionary, which I, when I saw it, I said, oh, I said that, gosh. Um, but I think, you know, his genius, as we have all learned, he couldn't draw. Um, his best architectural work is all collaborative. I think he was a good architect and he had some good ideas. But I do think his, his genius was institution building and connecting with people and uh, having a great concept. And, and I often, you know, there was a point when I realized I was never gonna be in a punk band, and I would give my my books good titles. For example, Haunted Bauhaus. Like uh, you know, that idea has really kind of led me down the intellectual path. Oddly, the the title has often helped me, helped steer me just for you know to have my own mental brand for this project. So I think you are absolutely right that uh, one can't underestimate having a good idea to organize people and draw them together, and then you know to put the the right flesh on the bones to allow them then to enter that space and, and have the conversation or, or work with their hands or you know, connect with each other. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think that's spot on and building the institution, bringing the people together. And, and I would just only throw this toward, toward Jeffrey as an expert on Black Mountain College, but also you, know, you think of Joseph Albers as this doctrinaire, you know, really kind of strict modernist, but you look at the people he invited to Black Mountain. Mm -hmm. You look at the heterogeneity of, of the group, and that's why it was so vibrant. And he may not have loved, um, and he brought so many interesting people whose work, and you'd look at them and say, well, what did these have in common? And what they have in common is that they're deeply interesting, and they have something to say. Um, and so I think as doctrinaire, uh, as, as uh, as the Bauhaus might seem, as Albers really seems, um, they got that you need to have a lot of different voices, um, some of which question the whole enterprise to begin with and mm -hmm. force from first principles us to ask, why are we here? What are we doing? For whom do we exist? And, and I think great institutions do that. Um, yeah. yeah. I think in that sense, it probably was not that different than many of the debates that go on inside initially companies and corporations, and now the extension of the idea of brands so that even a museum says we need to protect our brand, a university, we need to protect our brand. And one, if you're not involved in a commercial enterprise, initially it's a little bristling to hear these types of words taken over into um, other enterprises. But certainly, uh, you know, Gropius was very, very savvy, not only in the invention of the name, but I mean, look at this guy. 1919, he finds a, he starts a school in a rather obscure location, famous yeah. but obscure, in um, you know in Germany. And his aim is to get people to come. Uh, and the story of Marcel Breuer, who sees uh, some of the graphic work and the manifesto in Vienna, doesn't like his education and heads off buyer the same thing. The 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 invention of the brand, but then inside. Because I think one thing we have to maybe, this would be the topic for a whole discussion, what is the relationship between brand and reputation? You know, at what, at what so some of the things that you're talking about, two short-lived institutions didn't live very long. Um, uh, they have a, a, a recognizable brand that we, now many people we've heard, Steve Jobs and others, yeah. would like to be associated with an extinct brand. That's already a kind of, of topic, but could they have lived for 14 years being so vibrant, so exciting, bringing so many people in and, um, and survived a set of questions about protecting the brand? When does protecting the brand foster innovation and 
excitement, yeah. Yeah. and when does it shut things down and uh, and become stultified tradition? Yeah. That's a I mean, big that issue. That seems to really be the trick, because these short-lived institutions produced people and products and things that testify to something about their essence that we can continue to hold on to. And that's where the proof of the idea lies. So that perhaps there's, there needs to be a willingness to, and I can see how this could not work in many ways, but to relinquish control of the brand and to allow it to develop um, based on the good work that people associated with it do. And that because Black Mountain College, because the Bauhaus were short-lived institutions, they had to do that by, by default, yeah. in a sense. They didn't have the opportunity to be managed in the way that we manage things like this today and try to turn everything into a soundbite, yeah. which then ends up being empty. So why not create a concept that's associated with something that has a name that then can be broad enough for those who work under that umbrella to give it meaning. So when you're voicing a brand, I mean, what I, I've lived with this just, since I heard it for the first time today is why write in capital letters when we don't speak in capital letters? You know, and that says to me something so profound about communication mm -hmm. and about don't shout, don't shout. If you're, if you're speaking in capital letters, you're shouting and you're not listening. Uh, but, you know, uh, and that's, that's by it is absolutely brilliant, polemical best. And surely that absolutely is the DNA of, of the brand. You know, don't, we don't speak in capital letters because we're actually actively listening about what's going on. So I don't know, but that seems to be part of it. Not accidental, intentional. Yeah. yeah. Gordon. Um, this has been a wonderful seminar, and thank you very much. Can you explain or the, the tragedy of the 30s and early 40s, World War II and whatever, mm -hmm. seems to have brought out of Germany and out of other parts of Europe a great deal of design and um, yeah, engineering and science that people who fled the Holocaust or fled Germany in the 30s and 40s and it sort of started to change America in terms of what we were doing. And even after the post-war era, Europe had uh, re reconfigured and really cre recreated design and art in a different way than America did in a much more modern, contemporary fashion, whether it was the Germans, the Italians, the Scandinavians. And in effect, the contemporary design movement really moved from Europe into this country. The Bauhaus being a very big example of it, where architects and artists moved here in the late 30s and started the, 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 the movements. Is there something that goes on in the art and design in Europe that we haven't had, or now we're starting to, but haven't had a big depth of that going on in America? And Edmund, you're maybe the one who can talk most about the art world in, in Europe. And, and you're per se, per se. Do you know, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to say that is another three-day seminar. So I'm, 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 I, might, I, might, I might answer that by saying, of course, there's a huge amount going on in, 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 in Europe in the post-war period, which, isn't, which doesn't necessarily hold the, the identity of the Bauhaus in terms of, of the ways in which we've been talking about it since. But, but I'm, I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause. I'm going to pass that straight on down the line because I'm not sure I can answer that and say that there is a particular movement that, that, that actually can equal or has parallels with the power of, 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 of the legacy of the Bauhaus. I, I could just say briefly, I mean, academics <clears throat> in Germany, you know, I mean, they lost everything. They, you know, they, and discussion with stilted people who stayed were anxious to prove or fabricate their innocence. Um, you know, the, the level of critique really 
suffered and it, it took, uh, well, you know, the, I think the allies coming in and not, not doing another Versailles Treaty to kind of rebuild the intellectual infrastructure. Uh, certainly a lot needed to be actually rebuilt so that in some ways brought some innovation. Um, but I think a lot of what you're talking about is maybe more 50s and 60s de design, kind of the children of this generation throwing off the man mantle of uh, the oppressive generation, uh, especially in Germany, but you know, elsewhere where, where nationalism was so, you know, and refining the spirit of internationalism in play and, and all of that. So I'm guessing that's a lot more what you're thinking about. Um, but, you know, so much came here because so many people had to leave their homes. You have so beautifully excited, inspired, and informed us. I think a very fitting way to end this session and our time together is to ask each of you just very briefly to give us one thought to take with us. Bauhaus today. Barry, I'm gonna start with you. Wow. Um, well, this has been such an exciting two days. I'm not sure whether I wanna bring something uh, for that last thought that I came with or something that I've, uh, I've learned while being here. Um, but I think one thing that we've all discussed is what an open, exciting, innovative place the Bauhaus was, a kind of cross-current uh, of, um, of thought, of innovation, of constant experimentation, and in the preliminary course, the submission of even one's very first ideas to discussion, to critique, to open discussion, in a place where people were coming from all over Europe. So it was not actually a national institution, even though it had state funding. Hungarians arrived. People wanted to be near, to be associated with it. So it was an open place, a place of, uh, of open borders, of experimental thought, and of open discussion. Um, maybe, maybe simply, uh, <laughs> it's hard. Maybe simply boldness, um, ideas that, that capture people's imagination. And, um, and, and, that's, and that's really the thing, I think, um, propositions that that overturn what we thought was possible um, and that have a broad base to them. I think moving fast and breaking things is, mm. is one way to do it, mm -hmm. um, but I think when there is buy-in and when there is a, gen a, a genuine and broad-based feeling um, for a bold idea that, that really captures the imagination, then that, um, the possibilities are unlimited and I think anything less is is not that exciting, and we wouldn't be talking about it 100 years later if it had been some sort of mealy-mouthed, mild art school. So I think, I think a boldness uh, with a lot of a lot of democratic buy-in um, is everything. Libby, I would actually agree with that, and yet say. Um, you know, I think we, I would really plea for, in, in all of our understanding of, of the past, uh, for, you know, looking for who's not speaking in capital letters and, and teasing out those, those other stories, um, because there's, there, you know, there's so much more to the Bauhaus than the few things that, that get conveyed in, in the, the one loud note about it. Mm -hmm. I think that, um we need to think very carefully about education and not lose sight of the fact that the Bauhaus was a school and that it was a school in which there was a looseness to a curriculum with parameters so that within parameters one could be extremely creative, but that we need parameters. Parameters are necessary within which to work. So if we can think today, perhaps in our educational system, about what parameters we want to establish to enable creativity to take place. Poet, philosopher, artist, we end with you. Oh God. <laughs> um, no pressure, though. <laughs> ideas in transit, people in transit. And the reason I'm wearing my Bauhaus tie is because the Japanese potter, Shoji Hamada, visited Black Mountain College in the 1950s and he meets Annie Albers and he sees Annie Albers in that workshop with knit, making knitted 
objects, takes home that cloth to Japan, and makes a tie out of Annie Albers's cloth. And so when you go to Japan, all the craftspeople in the folk craft movement in Japan have knitted ties. All of them, men and women, have knitted ties. And so it's ideas and people in transit. It's, it's all the way through the Bauhaus into Black Mountain College to a visiting Japanese potter, and then suddenly in the folk craft movement in Japan, knitted ties. So I'm wearing my knitted tie because the Bauhaus is in transit. Wow. <laughs> Bauhaus, Bauhaus, the making of modern. Thank you very much. Thank you, and let's thank our panel one more time. Thank you for moderating, Eric. I just want to say quickly, we're so grateful to all of you for your participation over the last two and a half days, and we hope that you've enjoyed this deep dive celebration of the Bauhaus. I want to say that uh, obviously it took 100 years to get to the centennial of the Bauhaus, but it actually took almost two years just to put this program together. So if you'll indulge me for just a couple of minutes, I do want to say a few important thank yous. First of all, I do want to thank all of our presenters for sharing your time and your knowledge and coming to Aspen and joining us here today. Of course, also, this wouldn't be possible without all of our generous underwriters. And so I want to begin by thanking Edith and Modi Furter and Lugano Diamonds for being our presenting underwriter. Yes. And careful, I'm going to try to go quickly, so don't, don't applaud after everybody, please. But I do want to thank Linda and Stuart Resnick, as well as Paul and Jim Crown, Harriet Gold, Rachel Kohler and Mark Hoplamazian, Melanie and Adam Lewis, Jane and Mark Nathanson, Susan Taylor and Robert Pugh, Carol and Gordon Siegel, and the Aspen Outfitting Company, all of whom uh, contributed to this program. Um, I also want to recognize a few other people whose partnership was instrumental in the success of this program. Uh, Kathy and Mike McCoy, of course, all of our exhibitors and workshop facilitators, and Kasani Viola Design. And then finally also, uh, as you may have noticed, we had a tremendous uh, output of energy from our staff here at the Aspen Institute. And I wanna begin by recognizing Chloe Taba and the entire Society of Fellows team who put so much time and effort into this. Um, of course, we all know Kitty Boone and John Melgar contributed, Deborah Murphy and the Conference Services team, Rachel Butler and the Aspen Meadows team, and of course, Lissa Ballinger. We've recognized you a couple of times, but we can't thank you enough for lending your talents to this. So I want to thank all of you for your support and engagement during this program, and now is a time for celebration again. So we're going to proceed to the closing reception, not just for the Bauhaus, but for the entire summer that we've celebrated here at the Society of Fellows. And so we thank you so much for all of your support and participation, and we hope you'll join us on the terrace upstairs. Thank you. Warwick, Warwick. Yes. I can't underscore enough our gratitude for Walter and Elizabeth Pepke for creating this incredible institution and inviting Herbert Beyer here. We wouldn't be here 100 years later celebrating if it were not for Walter Pepke. I don't know your dad, I didn't know your dad, but I'm getting to know him through you, Tony. We're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you.